Good afternoon. It's Friday the 25th of November 2022, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me today by video link, we've got Patrick Henningsen and Vanessa Bailey. As usual for Friday, thank you both for joining us. Uh, we'll get straight on here with uh, strikes. And of course, we've got a postal strike going on today. We've got real strikes coming up. Uh, and the uh, uh, Royal College of Nursing has announced the dates of the first two uh, strikes of nurses. Uh, in the NHS. So the first strike action will take place on the 15th uh, and 20th of December. So that's Thursday the 15th, Tuesday the 20th of December, uh, because the government has turned down uh, their formal offer uh, of formal uh, detailed negotiations as an alternative to strikes. Now, it's a little unfortunate that they've headlined this uh, press release NHS pay dispute because the pay is only part of it. Uh, yesterday, Debbie was speaking uh, to Roy Lilly, who is uh, an independent health policy analyst. Uh, and this is what he had to say about the, uh, the upcoming nursing strikes. The nurses, are, um, tomorrow, um, I'm not sure when this is going to be broadcast, but we're recording this on the 24th of November at about quarter past two in the afternoon. I can tell you that I do know that the nurses tomorrow on Friday will be announcing their strike dates. Um, for December. And I mean, nobody wants to see the nurses going on strike. It's a horrendous moral and ethical dilemma for everybody. But if you talk to nurses, yes, they, you know, they, they want their pay sorted out, but a lot of them are saying exactly what you said. And as an ex-nurse, you will know this is right, that they are concerned that they're, they're practicing dangerously. They're not practicing safely. Then they're concerned that they can't do the job properly because there's just not of, not enough of them. Now, the Royal College of Nursing uh, press release did say uh, that safety was a part of it, but that was uh, halfway down their announcement. Uh, but in the meantime, they're saying that strikes are going to take place in England, Northern Ireland and Wales, um, and that they are going to happen in phases. So um, as uh, Roy Lilly is saying there, um, Patrick, I mean, this, this is a, a fairly uh, significant step for health care workers to um, to take this kind of action. But, you know, Debbie has been pushing the patient safety issue within the NHS quite a lot over the last few weeks. This is clearly an issue that they feel strongly about. And so this is just want to make the reinforce the fact that this isn't just about pay, but the fact that uh, so many people are leaving the NHS at the moment that nurses feel that they can't provide uh, the uh, level of care that's needed. Yeah, the, the the bottom line here, Mike, is uh, if you're in a country with the National Health Service or any kind of state-run uh, uh, free care at the point of service uh, medical system, when your nurses go on strike, uh, the government has failed. There's no other way to, to, to describe it. It's total failure by government. If it's to the point where nurses are going on strike and you have the potential of any disruption of medical services. And this is supposedly the pride of the nation, as a lot of people sort of joke but are half serious that uh, uh, Britain is uh, basically a country uh, that's attached to uh, a national health service. Um, that's the way people like Piers Morgan were virtue signaling during the so-called pandemic. It was all about the NHS. Everybody changed their profile on their social media uh, accounts with NHS logo. So if a government can't even do basic functions for this NHS, then that's pretty much a F on their report card. And there's no other way around that. It's, that's what it is. And it, that's an extension of pretty much everything they've done over the sort of COVID, COVID crisis. Indeed. Uh, OK, well, let's uh, move on to energy prices then. And uh, the uh, Ofgem has announced the new uh, energy cap. So let's uh, bring this on screen. The estimate from uh, last year, or, no, sorry, from earlier this year, was that uh, January 2023 energy cap would be £5,405. In fact, uh, now that it's been announced, it's going to be £4,279, so slightly less. Um, so for the quarter from uh, January to the end of March, uh, 2023, the government is going to be picking up the tab uh, for everything that's on the right hand side of that line, which uh, I think is going to come to around £1,700 uh, on average uh, for the uh, uh, the average household. Uh, but then um, the question is, what happens in April? In April, the, uh, the cap rises to £3,000 per year annually uh, for the average household up from £2,500. So the government will be paying uh, everything to the right hand side of that line. Uh, the increased line 
uh, from April on, so we wait to see what happens there. Uh, undoubtedly, this estimate that's on screen at the moment will be a little bit higher than, uh, than will actually turn out to be. But nonetheless, this is still a significant amount of money that the government is going to be. And just to put it in perspective, the current uh, estimate is that uh, the government will be spending £42 billion pounds to pay for this, which is a third of the NHS budget. So just uh, think of it in those terms. Now let's uh, move on to migration. And yesterday, the Office for National Statistics pushed out the latest statistics on migration, and they estimated net migration of non-EU nationals in the year ending June 2022 to be 509,000 509, extra uh, people in the first six months of uh, the year. Uh, and uh, that compared with uh, 51,000 EU nationals that went home and 45,000 British nationals that were living abroad that came back to the UK. Uh, now, on Wednesday then, uh, Suella Braverman uh, was speaking to the Home Affairs Select Committee in uh, the House of Commons, uh, and she was, well, just listen to the question and listen to the response. Thank you, Chair. Home Secretary, welcome to the committee. We're a very friendly committee, uh, really. Of course. Can I ask you one general um, uh, question, and then I want to uh, go into the recent uh, increase in numbers coming across the, the channel. Okay. Let's do a bit of role play. I'm a 16-year-old orphan from an East African <coughs> country escaping a war zone and uh, religious persecution, and I have a, uh, a sibling legally in the United Kingdom at the moment. What is a safe and legal route for me to come to United Kingdom? Um, well, we have... Uh, th th you're fleeing which country, sorry? Any what African you, country. Any African country. Well... Be any continent, but let's say any African country. I don't want to name one because then their Prime Minister might have a go at me for demonising their population. So let's just theoretically talk about an African country which is going through a period of turbulence and which is persecuting its citizens, including an innocent 16-year-old like me. Well, we have um, uh, an asylum system, and people can put in applications oh. for asylum. How would I do that? Well, you can um, uh, you can you can do it uh, through the safe and legal routes that we, we have. We we John. have offered three hundred ninety thousand places uh, to people seeking safety from various countries around the world. I'm not Syrian. Um, I'm not uh, Afghan. I'm not uh, Ukrainian. Not any of those specific <coughs> schemes. The Dub scheme uh, is historic. What schemes open to me? Well, if you are able to get to the UK, you are able to put in an application for asylum. But I would only enter the UK illegally then, wouldn't I? Well, that, that would, if you put in your application for asylum uh, upon arrival, that would uh, be the, the process that you enter. How could I arrive in the UK if I didn't have permission to get onto an aircraft legally to arrive in the UK? Uh, let me just invite other colleagues, if there's anything they want to add. I mean, you, you, you could engage with UNHCR. I mean, depending on which country you're from, you could engage with UNHCR, and that would be a way of, of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of yeah. getting um, leave to enter the UK in order to put in an asylum claim. But I accept that there are some countries where that would not be possible. So the person speaking at the end there was Matthew Rycroft, a former uh, UN uh, representative to the United Nations. Uh, Vanessa, I don't know what you think about that, but uh, that came across to me as a pretty spectacular exchange because clearly neither Suella Braverman nor Matthew Rycroft were prepared to tell people publicly, or at least they certainly didn't want to tell people publicly, that in fact the only way for people to come into this country uh, is to do so illegally. Uh, and then apply for asylum. Uh, and of course, what they're effectively admitting here is that uh, government policy, it, there, in fact, there is no migration policy uh, in a sense because there's no way for people to apply for through a process which may limit the number of people that come into the country. Yeah, I mean, that's quite extraordinary. And of course, we have the history of Matthew Rycroft at the UN, as you mentioned, on. Uh, Syria um, bumbling his way through the chemical weapons narratives and unable to provide evidence of the samples that were allegedly sent to Porton Down but weren't sent to Porton Down. And effectively, you know, this guy seems incapable of answering a question directly, and this isn't any different. And Suella Braverman, I mean, she just, oh. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting exhausted by the successive government inability to respond to questions because they're effectively um, either corrupt or they don't know what they're doing. It has to be one of the two. 
or they know that they're covering for a, for an you know an illegal abusive system. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, sticking with the migration uh, issue here, uh, let's bring on screen. Uh, let, sorry, let's bring on screen the uh, three stooges here, we might call them. So who have we got here? Well, the, first of all, the Austrian Chancellor uh, issued a, an attack on the EU migration measure. So at EU level, it's not working either. So that he has signed uh, a trilateral agreement with uh, Serbia and Hungary in order to deal with what they describe as Balkans border security. Um, so they met in Belgrade to sign this uh, and uh, Carl uh, Nehammer was saying the EU's asylum system has failed. We've come to the point where individual EU countries are looking for new forms of partnership outside uh, what is in the EU. Um, so we're going to be uh, covering or talking about uh, uh, the Serbian president uh, a little bit later in the programme. But uh, it's, it is interesting, Vanessa, that these three uh, have chosen to get together to tr effectively close their borders uh, and stop migration and you know they're saying basically that uh, uh, most of the the migration pressure that they're experiencing is coming through t Turkey Bulgaria Macedonia uh, and then th and into Serbia and then on into the EU so they've decided to take matters into their own hands mm. <clears throat> well I mean Orban has a history of being described as right-wing purely for the fact that he protects his borders um, and the sovereignty of his country Vucic is a slightly different um, category, and we'll talk more about him uh, in the second section that I'm doing today. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to come to this uh, BBC report, which was on the 9th of November, um, entitled Albanian Migrants, Why Are They Coming to the UK and How Many Have Arrived? Um, and if we actually look, what I've done is just um, cherry pick from the BBC article. So effectively what they're saying in 2020, 50 arrived on small boats, in 2021, 800, and in 2022, 12,000. So an exponential leap in Albanian migration into the UK. And bearing in mind, Mike, what you said, um, how did they manage to enter? Albania is not a country at war. Um, they are also uh, permeating throughout Europe, of course, and have been for some time. But Europe is relatively easier in the sense of the Schengen visa um, will give you, what is it, uh, 90 days, I think, before basically you either have to leave or you have to get residency, etc. Um, 10,000 single adult men have entered the UK. Um, and this is quite interesting because there was a recent report or, or a letter written by a North Wales MP, Janet Finch uh, Saunders, who was complaining about the fact that 200 uh, adult male refugees had been allowed to stay at a hotel called the Hilton Garden Inn in a, a place called, and I'm going to murder the name, so to all Welsh speakers, I'm very sorry. I think it's Dol Garage, um, which has a population of 500. So effectively, these single adult male refugees have doubled the population and are staying in relative luxury, of course, in what is effectively um, a four-star hotel in the area, an area that doesn't have um, good transport services, it doesn't have good amenities, and so on. It's relatively remote. So, of course, she's questioning why these 200 male refugees have been allowed to settle, particularly in this area. So the BBC report carries on between July 2021 and June 2021. 22, the UK received 30,703 visa applications from Albanian citizens and granted 20,289 of them, according to Home Office figures. Only 361 of them were work visas. Um, this is from the BBC report, I hasten to add. Um, Albanians represent the highest number of foreign offenders sent back in the year to March 2022. There is a rise in crime by the Albanian gangs in the UK. Again, this is according to the BBC and the National Crime Agency, which stated in its report that these gangs were importing industrial-scale cannabis farming to the UK and are leading players in the UK 5 billion sterling cocaine market. They are one of the largest foreign national groups in UK prisons. And the Prime Minister of Albania, Eddie Rama, uh, 
um, a good friend of Tony Blair, as we'll demonstrate, uh, said in a tweet that the UK should fight the crime gangs of all nationalities and stop discriminating versus Albanians to excuse policy failures. Well, I mean, my response to that immediately, if they are the majority offenders, then of course they're going to be highlighted as such. Now let's have a look, and, and this is going to tie in also uh, to my report on the recent events in Serbia, as to who is involved in policy behind the scenes in Albania and of course since uh, the bombing, the NATO bombing of Serbia in 1999 and, and the declaration of uh, Kosovo's independence which has never been accepted of course <clears throat> um, by Serbia, Tony Blair has been instrumental in advising the Albanian government behind the scenes but he's not the only one. Um, a very familiar name as Tony Blair's spin doctor uh, Alistair Campbell on rebranding Albania. Uh, Eddie Rama is looking to rebrand the country, stereotypically known for crime and corruption, to help bring about change for his people. And that was actually written by Alistair Campbell in April 2014. But who else has been involved in this rebranding exercise in Albania? None other than the nephew of Alistair Campbell, Tony Blair's former spin doctor who advised the socialist successful election campaign, has been hired by the Albanian government Balkan Insight and Bill, and that was in May 2014. So clearly there is a strong connection not only with Albania but with Kosovo and with Serbia. Um, now what is interesting for me, and it's something that I kind of stumbled on, I'm sure other people were aware of it, I wasn't. Um, in September 2016, Tony Blair officially sort of wound up his operations in Albania. But what does that coincide with? By the way, his operations in Albania were funded largely by the UAE um, and in part by Saudi Arabia. But what actually happened in Albania at the same time as Tony Blair withdrew from Albania? This is taken from uh, Wikipedia. The uh, Iranian terrorist cult, MEK, Mujahideen al Khalq, um, that were being settled in Albania from 2013 onwards by the United States. Um, the final uh, 200 and, 280 remaining MEK members were moved to Albania on the 9th of September 2016. So basically, as soon as this MEK transference and resettlement in Albania was completed, Tony Blair walked away from his advisory role in Albania. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Um, interesting also that there was an Albanian sniper squad um, detected in Syria in 2018, although uh, there are beliefs that uh, they were there before then. Um, they worked closely with, if you go to the next part of the uh, article, um, it's a small Sunni jihadi militant group operating in the Idlib governorate North Aleppo who are ethnically Albanians, though originating from Kosovo. And in my next section, I will show the relations between Albania and Kosovo and Serbia. Um, they've recently released, sorry, Mike, can you go back a bit? <laughs> They've recently released a video on their sniper squad, although the group as a whole has additional members and are not limited to snipers. It appears to be no more than 10 members at present, and of course, they work closely in collaboration with Hayat Tari al Sham or Al Qaeda. Of course, MEK now is heavily involved um, in the destabilization project in Iran. Um, there are uh, reports that they have also settled in northern Iraq, where they are alongside some of the Kurdish Contras funneling arms into Iran um, to arm the so-called protesters in order to carry out attacks against security forces um, in Iran. This is a mainstream article, Albania and Iran's distant MEK, I would replace that of course with terrorist MEK a marriage made in the US, but also uh, in collaboration with Israel. Israel is not averse to using the MEK um, to carry out assassinations and sabotage uh, on Iranian territory. So 
it, that there's an interesting correlation here between um, the Albanian extremists, uh, Muslim extremists, and, and that connects again into Kosovo and into um, Serbia and what's going on there. But then let's have a look at what the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change is doing right now, equipping leaders and making change, so nothing changes um, there. But what is he heavily promoting? Protests and polling insights from the streets of Iran, how removal of the hijab became a symbol of regime change. And if you go to the website of the Global Challenges, you can see to what extent he is really, or the institute itself, is pushing for regime change in Iran. 84% of Iranians who are anti-compulsory hijab also want regime change, as a number of my Iranian friends said to me, where on earth do these figures come from? But we know perfectly well that they're pulled out of thin air whenever the West needs them. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Brilliant. Uh, Patrick, have you got any thoughts on what we've just covered? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we should also add that uh, uh, with Tony Blair as the uh, chief advisor to Eddie Rama, it was jobs for my friends, not just for my friends, uh, for my wife uh, as well. Sherry Blair uh, was given the honor of uh, overseeing the Albanian uh, judiciary and reformatting that as their chief consultant. And she was charging the government in Albania something like a thousand pounds per hour. And she managed to claw back uh, in, in one deal, I think it was one deal that was a, a complete disaster, managed to claw uh, half a million quid uh, for her and her legal uh, consultancy, uh, uh, all at the expense of the people of the good people of Albania. So Sherry Blair did incredibly well, uh, lavish fortunes uh, from her husband's role as uh, Eddie Rama's chief advisor. Uh, yes. And uh, Patrick, uh, a number of years ago, at one of the alternative view uh, events, uh, a gent called Olsi, and you're going to have to remind me how to pronounce his surname because I could never get it right. But Olsi gave a presentation on this uh, at AV, and that video is on the front page of the UK Column website at the moment. Just uh, uh, tell me how to pronounce his surname. I believe it's Yejezi. Uh, yes. Olsi Yejezi, I think. Yes. And if anybody hasn't seen that yet, it's well worth watching. Uh, now, Patrick, let's move on then to uh, robotics and police keep and peacekeeping, policing, I should say. Uh, what's the update on this? Well, let's, let's uh, look at this subject more broadly. A lot of people have seen uh, robots used in policing for like bomb disposal units and uh, putting, you know, these uh, machines into sort of sensitive areas where it might put officers' lives at risk. Here's a, a shot from the, uh, the science fiction film Elysium and uh, that many people have seen this film. And so the technology has moved on. Uh, because of AI, and this is now a big, uh, a big issue that's facing law enforcement uh, around the world, and uh, not just in the UK, uh, but also in the United States. And uh, here is uh, a recent article, which caught a lot of people's attention. Here, the San Francisco Police Department uh, has authorized uh, lethal force for for the for these robots, and this is in their documents. So. This raises a lot of serious uh, legal questions um, and also some serious uh, ethical questions and just policing in general, uh, as, uh, as we'll show you know, departments wanting to cut back budgets and so forth. So let's look at the documentation uh, on this particular story. And if you go to uh, this document here, you'll see this is the sort of legal framework uh, that was submitted um, to the uh, police department in San Francisco. And the area we want to focus on is actually in uh, Section 5 of this. And we'll pull that up here. And what does this say? Well, it's, this, it's this phrase here that's caught a lot of people's attention. Robots will only be used as a deadly force option uh, when the risk of loss of life to members of the public or officers is imminent uh, and outweighs uh, any other force option available to the San Francisco uh, Police Department. Um, so that's raised that specter that everybody feared uh, as to, you know, what, what, what is the end game uh, for robotics in policing? And we can extend this conversation to the military um, as well. And it, the, the fundamental point here, Mike, uh, that a lot of people are pointing to is that when it comes to this issue, human negligence 
in the case of an officer using lethal force or deadly force and machine error, um, these are not the same things. They're not the same things in the eyes of the law, uh, and they're not the same things when it comes to adjudicating um, an incident. Um, if a lawsuit or liability is brought or some sort of determination is being made by the court. Uh, so this really hasn't really been tackled. This is kind of uh, white space uh, for legal uh, proceedings and things like this. So we don't really know where we stand. And this brings us to this story. Uh, this actually happened. Well, it, it happened in a way. This wasn't an AI autonomous uh, robot. But in 2016, the big Dallas mass shooting that, uh, that we covered um, and some other people covered, the police used a robot uh, when the shooter was hauled up and the robot to deliver something like a hand grenade or an explosive device to kill the shooter because they deemed he was pinned down. He wasn't going anywhere. He had a limited amount of ammo, maybe a few uh, magazine clips, and they sent in a, a robot to drop uh, C4 or some kind of explosive uh, grenade-type device to kill this uh, the, the shooting suspect. So no investigation was conducted to say for sure whether he was the shooter yet. It might have been the case. But they just did this um, at the end of the pursuit of this uh, so-called mass shooting in Dallas in 2016. And that was the first time ever. Uh, so this was unprecedented. And it went without incident in the media. Nobody wanted to, to really look at this story and delve into it because the outrage of the mass shooting had already taken hold during the course of the events and afterwards, and nobody really wanted to question. They just thought, well, he's guilty. He's the shooter. Um, the shooter happened to be African-American um, as well, but firing on a sort of parade um, in Dallas. So was, the, the politics were a bit reversed on that. But So they didn't want to tackle that. So the, if we look at some of the devices here and some of the, the robotic solutions that police are coming uh, on with, they, they, they are quite powerful. And in terms of, you know, having a person behind some of these uh, robotic um, uh, solutions, that's one thing. Um, and remote control is one thing. Obviously, liability would be there. But when you come, you're one step away from autonomous robots. So there is no legal framework uh, for this. There is no uh, maneuvering that can be done um, uh, by the police department on this, other than it's got it's got to be a, able to assign blame. This is probably in the end going to allow police uh, with another layer of deniability. Um, and so, who do you sue if you had a liability issue? You sue the manufacturer. You sue the police department. Um, this all has to be fleshed out. This is a bit of a problem at the moment. And if we look at how this is advancing in the UK, this is becoming a big issue in the UK as well. There's a lot of different stories, and people have been writing about this, and uh, there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes on this, So, especially when it comes to uh, cutting police budgets. Uh, so this uh, autonomous policing is being seen as a potential solution uh, to budgetary problems. So they're calling this, in this police insight, this internal police uh, industry uh, website here, journal, the new normal for UK policing is an automated workforce. Now, they're talking about back-end administration as well, um, but I think they're also uh, throwing the robotic uh, issue in there as well. So that's going to be something that is going to be in the municipal policing. This, this extends to the military. Um, there's the uh, man of the future, uh, future army man, Nick Carter, uh, all about the future for the British military. And here, robot soldiers could make up a quarter of the British Army by 2030. So if it's if it's being developed for the military, you can be absolutely certain it's going to it's being developed uh, for the domestic uh, setting as well. So what where are we going to be on this in terms of um, whether we're going to be able to handle any of these types of issues um, or cases? Now the UN has weighed on this. 2013 um, has weighed that this is this basically should be at the moment illegal because they admit there's no legal framework here. This is in this General Assembly declaration here from 2013. It hasn't the, the conversation hasn't really moved on that much um, for the legal framework, but the UN acknowledged there's no legal framework. So where do we stand on this? Where, where can things go on this? Nowhere, as far as the UN is concerned, um, in, in terms of international law 
uh, and also domestic law as well. But nonetheless, Mike, the uh, UK legal community is moving ahead with great enthusiasm on this issue. So liability for robots, this is uh, Cambridge University Press, uh, legal challenges. And so let's, let's flag up exactly where they're at on this. So they're presenting an analysis and they're using an economic model to propose a new liability regime which blends negligence-based rules and strict manufacturing liability uh, rules to create an op optimal incentives for robot torts. They're talking about um, the potential for lawsuits here um, in the courts. But this is their one of their conclusions here, which should raise a few uh, eyebrows and some concern. This is from the legal community. The social cost of machine error promises to be drastically lower than that of human negligence. We should therefore welcome the development of robot technology. So you can see where this is coming from. It's being driven by the uh, lawyers, by the legal industry. Um, so they see uh, some advantages here. The courts see a potential lower cost in adjudicating these types of uh, cases as opposed to ones that involve human beings. So, you know, the, the RoboCop scenario is not so far-fetched in this sense. It's just going to take uh, a, a decade or two before the technology can reach a point um, where they might want to deploy um, that type of policing uh, more broadly. So it kind of, it's disturbing. It really all does come down to the legal issue, the legal framework on this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Now, if you like what the UK Column does, you would like to support us, uh, please head over to community.ukcolumn.org. There are options to help us out there. Uh, please, uh, you could pick something up uh, from the UK Column shop uh, as an alternative, uh, but do share the material you find on the various platforms. Now, uh, a week or two ago, Patrick, uh, we were talking about the absolutely disgraceful uh, attempts by the UK media to drive uh, well, to drive us into what a new global world war, uh, and uh, this was, of course, was related to the issue of the uh, alleged Russian missiles that hit uh, the across the Polish border and suggestions of Article Five and and so on. Uh, this seemed to originate, or at least a lot of it seemed to originate from a uh, an AP report. Uh, you've got an update for us. Yeah, it, it did actually originate from, from an Associated Press report and then sort of cascaded uh, through the media and around the world from there. So everyone saw this. So the, the, the question here is, there's a lot of talk about uh, dangerous misinformation online from alternative media, from people on Twitter, uh, social media users. So here we have a real case of dangerous misinformation or malinformation or whatever the terms um, that they're throwing out there, these, these trendy terms dismiss and malinformation. Here we have AP being the sort of uh, top level purveyor of fake news. And so much so that it pushed the world, at least for a moment, to the precipice of a kind of World War III situation. So AP ended up uh, firing, as uh, many reported a few days ago, firing the reporter who was responsible for the fake story, alleging that these Russian missiles had hit Poland. And so last, last Tuesday, AP issued a news alert citing uh, a senior U.S. intelligence official, quote unquote, uh, who claimed that R Russian missiles crossed into NATO and Poland, killing two people. And so that was the, that's all we knew at that point. And so you could only, obviously it was a fake news story and uh, incre incredibly dangerous, but you know, who was this senior U.S. intelligence official? Uh, how come AP ran with this? without sort of corroborating the story with their, you know, Polish news desk and so forth. So, and it turns out they sort of did, but here's, here is the journalist that got fired, James Laporta. And uh, this is what he tweeted uh, on the 16th, just to reiterate so people know. Poland's president says that the missile blast that killed nearly two, two near the Ukrainian border appears to be an unfortunate accident and intentional attack. So he kind of walked it back. Um, in the immediate aftermath and tweeted this. It didn't save him from getting sacked, uh, however. But this is the journalist, so this is the sort of person whose name's on the story. Uh, but is that really the person who should have been fired? Well, he sh maybe should have been fired, but it had to have been okayed at the highest level of Associated Press, and that's the main point here. But look at his LinkedIn bio, if you uh, 
uh, look at the upper corner here. It says a former intelligence cell chief in the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps. U.S. Marine Corps. So, I mean, that's not exactly um, high level uh, intelligence qualifications, but that's on his LinkedIn bio. Um, so, you know, he is a, uh, uh, yeah, so he's from the Marines. That's, uh, well, whatever. Um, so th- this what this came out in the last 24 hours. This is Max Tanny at Semaphore. Semaphore is an interesting website. They're, they're promoting kind of transparency for the mainstream media. So their goal is to kind of bring credibility and accountability back to the mainstream. And this is what they put out um, yesterday, AP fired reporter. They got leaked the Slack messaging. This is the internal messaging from Associated Press. So this is the conversation that went on in the run-up to this incredible fake news story um, that pushed the world uh, to a potential conflagration here. And let's look, let's look at these messages here. This is on the Slack messaging. So it started off with James Laporta in this conversation here uh, saying a, fo- a former American intelligence official vetted by Ron Nixon. Who's Ron Nixon? Ron Nixon is AP's uh, uh, news and investigation vice president. Okay, so the source was vetted by an executive at AP. So that's where the that's the first green light, right there. Ron Nixon. I don't think Ron Nixon got the sack on this story. I just I haven't seen his name pop up with getting fired. Uh, but anyway, this is this is the person who quote vetted this source, this alleged U.S. intelligence source, senior source. And they're talking about also missiles entered Moldova, uh, no casualties at this time in Moldova, two killed uh, in Poland on this farm. And so the uh, the reply from Lisa Jeff, who's Lisa Jeff? She's the editor of the European News Desk, News Desk for AP. She says, can we alert uh, fr- from that or do we need confirmation from another source um, in Poland? James Laporte's reply, interesting, he says to her, well, that call is above my pay grade. Well, that's kind of the point here that we're trying to make. Uh, it was above his pay grade, um, but yet they still okayed the story. And so, and they move on here and uh, some details uh, from someone from their Polish desk there, uh, Vanessa Guerra, and her role there is the uh, AP's Warsaw desk, saying since the Polish government spokesperson admits there is a crisis situation, I would vote for alerting this. Warsaw, Poland, senior U.S. intelligence official says, Russian missiles crossed into NATO member Poland, killing two people. So that's the AP Polish Warsaw desk, Vanessa Guerra, basically pushing that. So you can see how this is uh, moved on here. But here's the best line of all. She, she moves on and she says, we'll blow that up. Um, I can't imagine a U.S. intelligence official would be wrong on this. So famous last words. I mean, I've been betting against uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence community assessments um, pretty much as my default position for any statement, I'm batting 900 on my batting average on that. So, you know, rarely wrong. You're usually right nine out of 10 times. Uh, so occasionally you're, you get it wrong, but I'd rather be batting 900 than 100. The mainstream media is batting 100 uh, on their uh, trust for U.S. intelligence. And it, it gets interesting, Lisa Jeff here. Again, she's the editor of the European News Desk for AP. Are you okay with this? She asked the others. Um, uh, are you in a position to work up an urgent? No, actually, I'm at a doctor's appointment, says James Laporta. Um, what I passed is all I know at the moment. So James Laporta is is basically the fall guy on this. So he's put his name on this. He'll he'll he might have got sacked. He'll probably get promoted or end up at one of the major networks as a reward uh, for putting the story out. Uh, so they do reward failure in the mainstream media. And so, and again, uh, Zaina Karam, um, she's the deputy European news desk head. And she says, yes, should be okay, the story. I see the source was vetted um, by Ron Nixon. So again, uh, Ron Nixon, the vice president uh, of, of AP's news investigation department. So isn't that interesting? So there they go. And then James Laporta, well, we move on. James Laporta says, uh, wonder if this triggers Article 5. So after it's after it looks like it's gone down the pipeline, he's musing whether it triggers Article Five. So it's strange. So this is kind of the conversation on the internal messaging service of Associated Press. It's incredibly revealing. And so they, the 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 group think and just the kind of aloofness, especially the 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 journalist who's putting his name on it, 
is kind of a joke. I mean, if if you met some of these um, AP reporters from these various uh, news desks or assignments around the world, you might be thoroughly unimpressed uh, with their with their grasp or their grip of uh, geopolitics or international relations or political affairs in general. And it seems like you know they realize they understand their job is to is to grind an axe for Washington um, and to to do a, a pro Washington angle or an anti regime angle on any uh, particular story that comes on the desk potentially they can run with. That's been my experience in my limited interfacing with Associated Press um, out in the world. But this is uh, this is interesting. So I think there should be a whole raft of people that should have been sacked at AP, including Ron, uh, Ron Nixon, for basically vetting this alleged source who no one will ever find out who this deep throat was in, in Washington. But look at the chain of events that uh, unfolded as a result of this fake story. And all of the energy, all of the, the, the money, all this government uh, uh, gravy train for countering disinformation, you think about how much they're pouring into this and scapegoating the Russians, scapegoating uh, independent media, scapegoating people on Twitter. And here you have the biggest news agency in the world putting out an egregious fake story that's tempting World War III. And I don't see any inquiries about it. You know, the impact that had, it pushed governments to stop and have emergency meetings to consider whether we're going to move into a thermonuclear war situation or a DEFCON situation. Where is the debate? Where are the inquiries? Where are the government hearings on this? That's the, this is a real problem. Fake news from the mainstream media, from government, has real-world consequences, unlike all of the flotsam and jetsam that they claim is floating around that's so creating so-called online harms, dangerous disinformation online. It's a complete joke. This conversation is a complete joke by now. I couldn't agree more, Patrick. Uh, what I would just say is I would expand the criticism well beyond AP because uh, the, particularly the headlines in the, in the mainstream press in the UK were beyond a joke. I mean, it was, it, there was absolutely nothing funny about it. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, the mainstream media has a lot to answer for over that particular issue. Uh, it begins with AP, but it certainly doesn't stop there because the only UK-based media that were in any way uh, even slightly level-headed, and I, I'm not letting them off the hook in any way here, was The Guardian. The rest were atrocious. So uh, we need to come back onto this issue, absolutely. Now, Vanessa, one of the issues that we... Sorry, Patrick, did you want to just add something there? I just want to add that, that that's one of the problems AP has and Reuters. The news agencies feed the mainstream media outlets, most of them, with uh, the majority of their content. So they basically, whatever's coming off their desk is unquestioned, mostly AFP, Reuters, AP. They have so, uh, so much credibility for all of these mainstream outlets, they basically rinse and repeat anything coming out of these agencies. And so they, their job should be to vet what's coming out of the news wires. Uh, rather than just unquestioningly uh, repeating it and then running, even amplifying it and going further with the narrative, as we saw with the British press, which was totally irresponsible, but of course, par for the course. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, one of the uh, other stories that we were talking about in recent uh, programs was the issue of Kosovo and uh, and Serbs in Kosovo and and uh, uh, number plates and so on. Uh, there have been uh, some developments because that this whole issue of the number plates in Kosovo was looking like it was going to uh, start some kind of uh, or could escalate into some kind of conflict, Vanessa. So, so what's the latest on it? Well, again, I think you have to remember um, that Alexander Vucic, the president in Serbia, is not in charge of his country. That's number one. He's uh, advised again uh, by Tony Blair. And I spoke to a number of my um, colleagues in Serbia last night about this entire situation and how they perceive it is that effectively all of the kind of uh, hyperbole around um, the, the dispute over the car plates, basically what was happening is Serbia was still uh, registering the uh, number plates of uh, uh, Serbian nationals inside Kosovo. Kosovo was threatening to impose 
fines on any plates from Serbia. So this was basically being blown up into some kind of much bigger scale dispute, both in the media, but also by Vucic. But why? You have to remember who is advising him, who's teaching him, Alastair Campbell and Teflon Tony. And as I go through this report, you're going to see to what extent Vucic is being coached um, by Tony Blair, but is also in a very dangerous position himself. The people of Serbia, of course, are traditionally anti-NATO pro-Russia. Vucic is a NATO man, uh, he's a Blair's man, but also um, I'll, I'll come on to the, the US influence that's being upped now in Serbia. So effectively, this entire dispute blew over, but what did Vucic do? According to those that um, are against the Vucic uh, authoritarian government, he handed over control. So in other words, uh, Serbia has never recognized Kosovo independence. There are a small percentage of Serbs, um, the majority of whom are Christian Orthodox living in the north of Kosovo, who are constantly both ghettoized uh, and tormented and persecuted by the largely Muslim Albanian um, origin population in Kosovo. And so effectively what he's done is, is, is cut off the final tie between Serbia and Kosovo Serbians. And so that's how it's perceived um, by my colleagues in Serbia. And as I said, on the 11th of March 2022, so almost literally two weeks after the Russian special military operation started, Christopher Hill was confirmed as the new US ambassador to Serbia. Um, people can freeze the screen and look at this, but for, for purposes of time, he was heavily involved uh, in the NATO, NATO um, organization of former Yugoslavia. He was involved in the Rombuye meeting in Paris uh, post-1999 bombing of Serbia to determine the self-governance of Kosovo. This guy is a heavyweight um, US operative, particularly with regards um, to the Balkans. And according, again, to my colleagues in Serbia, they said this decision was effectively taken by Christopher Hill. Um, Tony Blair, as I've mentioned, has been advising the Serbian government, in particular Aleksandar Vucic, for some time. Of course, Blair, going back to um, the late 90s, had some serious um, terrorist crime syndicate connections, the main one of which, if you go to the next slide, I think, Mike, um, is uh, Hashim Fassi, um, who, if we go to the next slide, please, um, he's from the Dranica region of Kosovo, where the Kosovo Liberation Army originated in the 90s. He established um, a group called Dranica, which was effectively a criminal syndicate based in Kosovo. He was Madeleine Albright's protege. Um, he ran various crime syndicates in the 1990s, which included drug trafficking and prostitution. Um, uh, the Drenica syndicate, sorry, I forgot, is also linked to Albania, Macedonia, and Italian mafia. Um, he joined the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army, which was effectively made up, as I said, of Albanian warlords, crime syndicates, and um, Muslim extremists, effectively Al-Qaeda. He joined them in 1993, became the leader in 1999 during the Rombuye negotiations in Paris that I mentioned and remained with the interim Kosovo administration after the NATO bombing of Serbia. Um, during his time, of course, in 1999 in Pristina and in Kosovo, he was in charge of the KLA when they were accused, um, and Carlo Del Ponte uh, wrote a very extensive investigation into this, of cross-border organ trafficking involving um, Serbian children and civilians. And of course, a further reminder that the founder of the White Helmet, James LeMessurier, was also in Pristina, Kosovo, in 1999 under um, the uh, direction of Bernard Kushner, who was the UN representative at that time, who was also believed to have been involved in the cross-border organ trade and, and child trafficking. 
and La Mesra was effectively then responsible for the transformation of the KLA into the Kosovo protection uh, forces. So the whitewashing of the KLA, which didn't really work because um, the corruption and, and the mafia-style crime has continued even as um, what they're effectively now known as the, the Kosovo um, security forces. Um, he became the leader of the Democratic Party of Kosovo, the, the PDK, um, won the 2007 elections. 2008, Fassi declared independence of Kosovo and became the first prime minister. 2016, elected president of Kosovo. Bear in mind, 100 countries um, have recognized Kosovo independence. Serbia has not, and I think Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's three NATO member states have not yet recognized um, Kosovo as being independent. Of course, he's followed a pro-US-UK policy throughout his leadership. And in 2020, the Kosovo Specialist Chambers and Specialist Prosecutor's Office filed a 10-count indictment charging Fassi and others of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, if we can go on, Mike. So in 2020, he resigned, claiming that he was going to uh, protect the integrity of Kosovo um, and pleaded not guilty to war crimes. Interestingly, um, when I checked up on, on where we are with this uh, war crimes case against Thassi, um, it moves closer to trial. This was in September 2022. Um, and. Uh, the defense has announced that it wants former NATO officer Wesley Clark to be a witness on behalf of Thassi. So it's worth following this trial to see where it ends up. And of course, bearing in mind that Milosevic, Slobodan Milosevic, was almost immediately thrown into jail and um, was only posthumously exonerated of the crimes that he was accused of um, by the NATO lawyers. Vucic's uh, reputation in Serbia is not good. This article was written in 2020 by Dragan Gilas, who was a former mayor in Belgrade and the founder of um, the Freedom and Justice Party and the Alliance for Serbia, so standing in opposition to Vucic, who um, made the claim in this article that Vucic has destroyed, that destroyed um, all of the um, democratic processes in Serbia and has taken control of the, ne uh, of the media, of the courts, of most of the institutions. So he has full control um, inside Serbia. Uh, obviously, the, the common feeling is that he was spitting on the graves of NATO bombing victims when he started to work uh, with Tony Blair. And moving on, Mike. Um, a Serbian MP, I'll just check her name, Marinika Tepic, uh, claimed in 2019 that Tony Blair played a major role in international officials accused of corruption receiving Serbian passports. The connection between various international officials who had a history of corruption in their own countries but were given citizenship and high level uh, financial positions or advantages inside Serbia had also strong connections to uh, Tony Blair. And this article, which was written in 2021, Vucic surfs on a wave of scandal that should drown him. This is in relation to a particular crime syndicate that had been arrested that had strong connections to Vucic. But in the Teflon Tony tradition, Vucic somehow, as the article states, manages to play victim and to come out of it as, as a, a nationalist defender of his country. But this is very much down to the, the spin doctoring of Campbell um, and Blair. So then I want to look at the fact that arms have definitely been coming in from Ukraine um, into Kosovo, into Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, into Macedonia. So this article was published in April, I think, by Paul Antonopoulos at uh, Info Bricks, if we move on. Um, and in, in the article it states, after supplying equipment, this is the UK, and emboldening a militarized Ukraine, Britain has now started arming Kosovo's Albanians with Javelin and NLAW anti-tank missile systems. The British Embassy in Belgrade has denied it. 
Um, however, Serbian Minister of the Interior, Alexander Vulins, insists that the UK did transfer weapons to Kosovo, stating, you are creating an army, arming them, giving them armored vehicles and tank systems, drones, conducting training, and we hear that you are sending them to trial courses in Turkey and Albania. And of course, this connects in to what we were talking about, um, reference the Albanian uh, refugees also, adding that the integration of Kosovo into NATO is only intended to provoke Serbia. Again, we have to bear in mind that whatever is coming out of the spokespeople of the Serbian government uh, is being directed by uh, the US and the UK. But here we have Maria Zaharova also pointing out, I think this was in June, um, reminding of the black market risks of Western arms for Ukraine already in Bosnia, Albania, and Kosovo. If we go to the next slide, Mike. Um, and this was in September. Again, bear in mind that Vucic is voicing concerns over the US providing Kosovo with arms while probably silently approving um, the actions by the US and the UK. That is how it's perceived by his opposition. Um, and this was also, I think, in September 2022, um, NATO to send more K-4 troops to Kosovo. It's worth mentioning that in Kosovo is one of the largest I mean, I will call it, it's a K-4 base, but it's effectively US-dominated and has the potential to hold up to 7,000 troops. It covers 955 acres of territory that was effectively stolen after the bombing of Serbia in 1999. Um, and of course, it was set up close to the then proposed um, Balkan, trans-Balkan oil pipeline. Um, this is another story which just demonstrates how Vucic sort of uh, manages to present himself or to brand himself as a, as a nationalist. Here you have uh, a story breaking about Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban discloses UK and US intentions to push Hungary to invade Serbia in 1999 during talks with the Serbian president. I've basically been told by, by again, a number of my Serbian uh, colleagues in including Dragana Trifkovic, that Orban made this uh, material available in 2019 in Rome. So this is not breaking news. It also was not possible at the time uh, for Hungary to send troops into Serbia. Even NATO was not really sending troops into Serbia at this time. And so therefore, this is a, a sort of a PR attempt by Vucic to present himself as an ally to Orban who is or appears to be genuinely anti-NATO, pro-sovereignty, and pro-Russia. Yeah, OK. Well, thank you for that, uh, Vanessa. We will keep an eye on how this develops. Uh, now, in the meantime, uh, the mainstream media propaganda continues. Here's the mail uh, this morning. Putin could use Novichok in mass casualty chemical weapons attacks in Ukraine. If his troops continue to lose ground, U.S. officials fear, uh, sources said. Well, what was the source of this particular story? It seems to be Politico in this case. Uh, and so who were the sources? Well, the concerns according to six people with knowledge of the matter, and that's all it's described as. So this is another non-story. Now, uh, let's just remember what happened in Salisbury a number of years ago and the British government response to that. But I was particularly just want to remind everybody of the uh, chief scientific or the chief medical officer's response to it, because uh, Dame Sally Davies, as, who was the chief medical officer at the time in 2018, said, uh, gave advice for anybody that thought they may have con come into contact with Novichok. My advice for any individual, wash your clothes and wipe down any personal items, shoes and bags with cleansing or baby wipes before disposing of them in the usual way. So the whole Novichok story, uh, completely ridiculous uh, in the UK. And the question is, uh, could it be used as any kind of mass casualty event? Uh, who knows, but uh, the, the, the Western media very keen to push the suggestion of it anyway. Just want to very briefly remind everybody of this article on the UK Column website, The Day of the Skripal uh, by Tim Norman, where he's uh, systematically going through the mainstream media coverage uh, with related to the Skripal event. Uh, and if you uh, don't come away feeling that it just doesn't stack up by the end of it, I'd be very, very surprised. Um, so anyway, moving on then, and I want to go to Africa and to Mali. 
Um, so here's Mali. Uh, it's one of the five main, well, the, the G5 Sahel countries. Uh, and uh, Mali has decided that it's time to kick French NGOs out. Uh, so France 24 here reporting Mali Junta bans activities of NGOs funded by France. Now we have a, a little bit of video here from a uh, from a, an African media source. Uh, just uh, have a listen to this. France had cut development aid over Mali's alleged use of Russian mercenaries. Bamako in turn claims Paris has been aiding and abetting terrorists in Mali. Many Malians are glad to see the back of France and its conditional aid. Que ça soit son départ, que ça soit le retrait, que ça soit tout ce qu'il fait comme aide ou bien subvention au Mali, le Mali peut en faire autant. Nous avons des ressources, nous avons l'agriculture, nous avons tout ce que nous avons besoin. Il suffit qu'on se donne la main pour vraiment avoir ce que nous voulons. C'est tout. So I thought it was very interesting that uh, this uh, Malian uh, individual uh, really making the point that Mali has everything that it needs. It doesn't need the conditionalities that come with aid and so on. And I just wanted to very briefly uh, highlight uh, some of the comments by Thomas Sankara, who was president uh, of Burkina Faso, which is just, just, just to the south of Mali uh, in the mid 80s. And very much the same type of sentiment. Just have a listen to this. Produit. Suffisamment de quoi nous nourrir. Nous pouvons dépasser même notre production, malheureusement. Par manque d'organisation, nous sommes encore obligés de tendre la main pour demander des aides alimentaires. Ces aides alimentaires qui nous bloquent, qui nous inspirent, qui installent dans nos esprits cette habitude. C'est un réflexe de mendiant, d'assister. Nous devons mettre de côté ces aides par notre grande production. Il faut réussir à produire plus. Produire plus. Produire plus parce que il est normal que celui qui vous donne à manger vous dicte également. Now, of course, it didn't end well for Sankara for expressing views like that. But nonetheless, uh, you know, th th there is still a movement within the Sahel countries uh, that they should be self-sufficient, shouldn't have interference from particularly Western NGOs and French NGOs in particular. Um, but it's not just the French NGOs that are the issue. And I think maybe Mali should be considering where they're taking their money from. Uh, let's just uh, bring this on screen. This is Conflict Stability and Security Fund. Now, I, I find that the, the name of this fund extremely interesting because to me, this is about the stability and the security of the conflict, not about preventing conflict. It's about keeping conflict going in these areas. Uh, and if we just uh, scroll through this, we see the number of programs that the Foreign Office has for the Sahel region uh, through the CSSF. Uh, and uh, well, here we have uh, Relief Web talking about this and some of the programs. Uh, but of course, if we look at uh, fcdospending.ukcolumn.org and look at how the uh, Foreign Office uh, reports the money that's being spent, uh, and I recommend everybody goes and has a look at this, we can't know exactly who is in receipt of this uh, CCF money, uh, uh, CSSF money, sorry, uh, in this region. Um, but again, and it's amazing how the themes uh, tend to follow the, through the news program. Who else is busy working in the Sahel and with particular interest in the Sahel, not other than Tony Blair? So, um, you know, the, the question then is, uh, Vanessa, very, very quickly, um, you know, the CSSF funneling money into NGOs, British NGOs, international NGOs, uh, they're going into these countries, they're destabilizing these countries. Uh, because these countries absolutely are not going to be allowed to develop if they can be possibly avoided? Absolutely. I mean, the CSSF um, has come under fire within Parliament, actually, for its lack of transparency and its lack of reporting or accountability as to where exactly the money is going. We know through Syria, of course, the CSSF was uh, funding, at one point, made a rescue that were funding the White Helmets. It was going into organizations like Incostrat, uh, Into, ARC Group, all of 
uh, which were sort of intelligence cutout agencies that were effectively, as you, as you state, infiltrating and destabilizing Syria. So one, as you also rightly state, this is not for stability and security. This is to maybe not to maintain um, the image of conflict, but certainly to maintain destabilization and retrograde steps for that country in order to make it easy picking um, for global Britain. Uh, indeed. I think you're being a little bit generous there, but anyway, we, we can discuss that more in extra. Uh, right, Patrick, let's uh, move back to the United States then uh, and uh, another mass shooting event. Yes, this was the sort of uh, latest high profile mass shooting event uh, over the last couple of weeks. This was in Colorado, Colorado Springs, the Q Club, uh, sort of LGBT uh, venue. And this has been pretty much dominating uh, the news cycle. Uh, over the last sort of week or so here just to reiterate what happened a gunman stormed into q club and opened fire five people were killed and at least 17 others wounded by gunshots the suspect 22 year old anderson lee aldridge uh, was taken into custody after being subdued by two patrons uh, in the nightclub so that's the that's the gist of the main story there and so this uh understandably is going to be heavily uh, politicized. And so because uh, the midterm elections uh, were running pretty much at the same time, so you can see the overlap there. Um, this has been viewed widely as a hate crime. Uh, in, in, in the initial reporting, even before any evidence was collected or anything, it, the media kind of ran with that hate crime thing, uh, a right-wing fueled hate crime, basically. That was the main narrative uh, for this story. Nobody really questioned it, and they kind of ran with it. And uh, if you just do a little bit of uh, probing on this, of course, uh, it becomes even more interesting is maybe this isn't your typical uh, mass shooting, if there's such a thing as a typical mass shooting. Here's the Washington Post, and it turns out that uh, the shooter in this case, uh, Anderson Lee Aldridge, three names, uh, is a known wolf. What is a known wolf? You've heard the term lone wolf, and this is what the media, law enforcement, the government will like to portray somebody acting on their own. This is a lone wolf. But a known wolf is someone who's, quote, on the radar of the security services or the police or the FBI before the latest incident. So he's already a known quantity uh, to law enforcement and, and, and the FBI as well in this case. So it has a federal dimension to it. And so let's look at the details of that here uh, on the Washington Post. According to Colorado Springs Police, the suspected shooter was charged with multiple counts of kidnapping and fel uh, felony menacing after a bomb threat incident in Colorado Springs in 2021. So what was he doing? He was, he was cooking up bombs at home, uh, this, this, this young man. So 20-year-old cooking up bombs at home. And, and then looking at the uh, court records on this, Colorado Springs District Attorney ultimately declined, declined to bring formal charges in the wake of the 2021 bomb threat incident, and court records for the case were placed under seal, according to the Colorado Springs Gazette at the time. What does that mean, Play court records were placed under seal? Uh, it means that basically it, it seems like it's going to have a, fe a federal seal on it or has a federal FBI dimension to it. So the question is, what happened at the time uh, when, of this incident? I don't think he was actually charged with anything, it's kind of let go. So my question is, and the question of anybody looking a little bit closer at this uh, alleged assailant here, was he enrolled in some kind of program at that point? Did he become an FBI informant? Uh, was he turned by law enforcement? Was he part used as, did he have a handler? All of these are, are legitimate questions at this point, considering what has happened in the last two weeks where he uh, storms into a, uh, a, a gay club in Colorado, uh, not, not really a bastion of a metropolitan culture, Colorado Springs. It's not New York or San Francisco or L.A. or anything like that. Um, more rural, sort of maybe slightly, oh, it's a liberal state, but a uh, conservative liberal, let's say. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't quite add up, uh, does it? So certainly doesn't to me. So but then we probe a little bit deeper here. And here, and this is the Denver Post, a couple of days later, according to court filings with the attorney, 
the Q Club shooting suspect identifies as non-binary. So will this affect a potential uh, hate crime charge? Asks the Denver Post, the major mainstream publication there uh, in Colorado. So this is suspect's uh, gender identity becomes an issue. So it turns out uh, Aldridge uh, goes by the pronouns they, them, and wants to be addressed in court as Mix Aldridge. That's not Mr. or Ms., but Mix. It's a, I'm, I'm not au fait with all of the pronouns, but um, which I try, we try to keep up. Uh, so that's an interesting d- uh, dimension to this. So that pretty much destroys the narrative that this was a, uh, a, a Trump-inspired right-wing hate crime, basically. And, and so we asked, I, I sort of staked my reputation right after this event and asked on my show, The Sunday Wire, is it possible that the shooter attended the Q Club, was a patron, was he LGBT? And that's the first question I, I ask. And the reason I ask that question, because I've seen mass shootings in the past, which I'll show you in a moment, where that was actually the case, and it turned out that that would be the case, and that would change the whole calculus of how you're viewing the story as well. So aside from the, the federal FBI involvement of this uh, man, Mr. Aldridge, Mix Aldridge, or whatever, in the past from the 2021 incident, the, you, you have this other LGBT dimension to the shooter. So here's a, a video clip. Now notice the reaction by the CNN anchor uh, when she finds out that he could he, he's uh, non-binary, uh, non-gender binary uh, on this total shock. They don't know where to run with the narrative because it basically collapses the whole right-wing hate crime uh, uh, story on this. But go ahead and watch this. So attorneys for the accused shooter, Anderson Lee Aldrich, say in new court filings tonight that the suspect now identifies as non-binary. In a footnote to a motion asserting legal privileges, the public defenders say, quote, Anderson Aldrich is non-binary. They use they, them pronouns, and for the purposes of all formal filings will be addressed as Mix Aldrich. So in other words, not Mr. or Ms. Joining me now, CNN political commentator Errol Lewis, also back with me, Al Franken and Joe Walsh. I don't know what to say about that. I mean, that's not anything that we had heard from his background. You know, people have been looking into his background. And uh, I don't know if anybody here, are you guys lawyers? I no. mean, you know, I don't know if, the, I, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, th- it, that's what he's now saying. It, it sounds like they're trying to prepare a defense against a hate crimes charge. That's the least of his problems, legally speaking. But it looks like they're trying to build some kind of sympathy or at least confusion on the question of whether or not this was purely motivated by hate. Such a, I mean, that is what it sounds like. We'll wait to see. So uh, it's good to see Al Franken's uh, back doing comedy again, uh, appearing on CNN as a pundit. But you see their legal correspondent just dismissing the possibility that this shooter could be, or this suspect could be LGBT uh, himself or they self or whatever. It's kind of incredible. So he's saying he's putting it on uh, to get more sympathy uh, in a potential trial. I mean, so they've dismissed that possibility completely. They are so married uh, to the narrative. So now you have doubt as to the motive of the shooter, but the media, AP and others, are still running with this kind of right-wing hate crime narrative. And it's just typical. They're, they haven't batted an eyelid because of the new evidence. Here's the owner of the Q Club. His name is Nick uh, Gretzka, and he's all over the media giving statements and so forth. And he's calling this shooting a new type of hate. So now, geniusly, they've spun this back at uh, Republicans and conservatives. Gretzka said he believes that the targeting of the drag queen event is connected uh, to the art form art form of drag queen uh, okay, uh, being, being cast in a false light in recent months by right-wing activists and politicians who complain about the sexualization or grooming of children. Uh, even though general acceptance of LGBT community has grown, this new dynamic has fostered a dangerous climate, a climate of hate, says this owner. And here's an interesting take here. He says, it's different to walk down the street holding my boyfriend's hand and getting spit at as opposed to a politician relating a drag queen to a groomer of their children, says Gretzka. I would rather be spit on in the street uh, than the hate get as bad as where we are today. 
So he's basically trying to turn that whole idea, the, the, the accusation that drag queen story hour for children um, is inappropriate and that it's uh, equivalent to grooming children um, to sort of accept this kind of, um, let's say, fringe extreme uh, thing like the, the, the drag queen culture that's becoming mainstream. So now to, to, to have any criticism of the drag queen uh, uh, idea being pushed on children is an equivalent of a hate crime, according to the AP and Nick Gretzka, who's a central character in this very emotive uh, event. And just to add, of course, the Bidens are, are weighing in. Uh, Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden reached out to Gretzka, the co-owner, to offer their condolences and re reiterate their support for the community, as well as their commitment to fighting back against hate. Uh, and gun violence. And Pete Buttigieg, the transport secretary, the first openly gay transport secretary, he's a pioneer in that sense. He says, if you're a politician or a media figure who sets up the LGBT community to be hated and feared, not because any of us ever harmed you, but because you find it useful, then you don't, uh, don't you dare act surprised when this kind of violence follows. Don't you dare act surprised. So Buttigieg, again, is running with this right-wing hate crime narrative. And there's been no police investigation yet. They, they haven't uh, done any proper de depositions or anything like that yet, but they've run with this. So you can see the juggernaut has already left uh, its, the station on this, and it's just rolling. And this reminds me of a, uh, the Orlando mass shooting, the Pulse nightclub shooting. This was a couple of years ago. Um, I believe this was in, like, 2015. And this was a major sort of, apparently the gunmen mowed down, uh, you know, 50 uh, victims in this. And it was immediately cast as a hate crime. Uh, and so I, I would point out here that uh, after the fact, we learned a couple of interesting things uh, about this story that didn't get much coverage at all. The fact that their father of the shooter, Omar Mateen, was a longtime CIA asset in Afghanistan. Not just any asset, he was being he was being tipped and groomed uh, to be the Afghan uh, in, uh, candidate for the presidency of Afghanistan um, as an alternative to Hamid Karzai. Okay, so very well connected, very well connected uh, family, and this is the father of this uh, alleged shooter, Omar uh, Mateen. And uh, this is the interesting part here: uh, a report in the Orlando Sentinel alleged that the shooter, Omar Mateen, was in fact a frequent visitor for years at the Pulse Gay Nightclub in Orlando. And it was definitely him, said one of the patrons. He'd come in for years, and people knew him, one customer said. Uh, another customer said that uh, uh, he had been talking with Mateen for up to a year on a gay chat mobile app. I think this is probably Grindr, uh, is the gay uh, chat app, dating app. Uh, so th this is a convenient detail that was pretty much left out of the mainstream coverage, although you can find these sort of things when you dig a little bit uh, deeper. So you can see that's just how narratives are constructed uh, at pretty much every single time to, to create political capital and extract as much out of it around an election as you possibly can. This is part now par for the course in America. And the Babylon Bee runs this story not to make light of any tragedy, but it is becoming kind of apparent to a lot of people. Journalists rush to the scene of a shooting to determine whether it's politically useful. Um, so there's enough people now talking about this who realize that there's uh, some major problems with the mainstream media and how they're running with these political narratives uh, in order to weaponize any of these uh, events without actually looking and, and interrogating where they should be, which was inter interrogating the narrative itself and looking at evidence and the past profile of the assailant. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there for today because we are absolutely out of time. Uh, thank you very much to Patrick and Vanessa for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes uh, on the main live stream if you're sticking around for a little bit of extra. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we'll be back 1 p.m. as usual on Monday. Hope everyone has a great weekend and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.